what we're going to cover today. What do we mean when we say drought tolerant? Things that you would care about. Planting. Benefits of selecting native plants. And then we'll have a Q&A, but you can ask questions along the way anyway. And then we'll go through some plant options, both native and non-native. And we will t provide you some resources. Um, I had hoped the library was going to print off the resource list, but they didn't. So I didn't either, sorry. Um, but you'll be able to get those links online in about a week on the YouTube. And Alex has a question. I can still print out the, the resources. Could you print just that one page? Thank you. Who in the room would like a printed copy? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, about 10. No sense in wasting paper. So what do we not mean by drought tolerant? We thought we'd start with what we don't mean. And we don't mean that. We don't want you to have nothing but rocks in your yard because it's not very appealing. So that is not what we mean by drought tolerant. Although that is semi-drought tolerant. Also, that would heat your house up a whole lot because all those rocks are going to absorb heat during the day and give them back off at night. Um, and it's an invitation for every weed in the world. And in Carbondale, I believe you cannot use herbicides. Is that true? And some people just prefer not to use herbicides. So that would be an invitation. That is correct. And what you just may be or did not hear on the Zoom is that those rocks will also heat up the soil and can cause that tree to need more water and or kill it. So this is not what we mean. And there is a word, it is called xeriscape. A lot of people pronounce it zeroscape. That's zeroscape. We don't want that. We want xeriscape with an I. It's xeric, drought tolerant. So what do we mean when we say drought tolerant? We want you to conserve water. Plants that are well adapted to doing that. Different maintenance methods that allow you to maintain whatever your landscape is in an easy manner. Why would you want to convert? There's a good reason right there. Conserve water. All of us here <laughs> in this part of the country are well aware of how little water there is and how much of the water that there is we don't get. We get to send it downstream because it is committed to other people who need water. Um, in other parts of the country, they think it's kind of unusual that we think we don't have enough water. Well, they don't have to send their water somewhere else, but we do. As you see, up to 50% can be used just to maintain your landscape. So if you can cut down your water usage by 50%, that's huge. Even if you can cut it down by 25%. We all have plants that we love. And they're high water plants sometimes. And there is nothing wrong with that. If you want a plant just because you want it, there are other ways to have that plant. The easiest method is put it in a pot because a pot can hold in the water. And you're only watering one thing. You're not watering the entire yard for one plant. So don't think you can't have other high water need plants. So I'm just going to talk for a couple of minutes about planning. And so before you start tearing up your yard and buying a bunch of plants, it's really 
helpful to spend some time in the design phase and selecting appropriate plants, shrubs, trees, grasses. Uh, the goal is the right plant for the right place. So by spending a little time in this planning phase, you're going to save yourself time, money, effort, and you're also more likely to end up with all of your plants having fairly similar water needs, making it easier to maintain and have plants that will thrive. So your design could be a professional uh, design from a landscape expert, or it can just be a, a do-it-yourself sketch with a plant list, um, but it is important to have a plan. So here is a plan, what a plan might look like. This one is available on the Colorado Master Gardeners website in a wonderful little booklet, a PDF called a Native Plant Guide for the Western Slope. So all of these plants are native to the Western Slope. They're happy here, they're cold hardy, and once they're established in your garden, they'll need very little, if any, supplemental water. So if designing is not your forte, you can just copy one of these uh, layouts and, and just follow along. So here's another design. Um, now, of course, your property is probably not this exact shape, so you could modify this design and just, um, it gives you an assortment of plants that grow well together, that look well together, and then you can just kind of fit it to your property. Um, oh, the, the Colorado Master Gardener website through the CSU Extension also has wonderful plant lists. So if you're looking for a tree and you want a drought-tolerant, evergreen, native tree, there's a list. Or if you're looking for a spring-blooming xeric flower, they have lists of flowers. So I found that very helpful. So. This is another excellent resource for layouts and designs, the website Plant Select. It's plantselect.org. Um, they have 18 different downloadable designs done by professionals. So this is a design that I chose a couple of years ago by Lauren Springer Ogden. It's a chaparral xeric mixed border, and it turned out lovely. It's all purples and pinks and yellows, and it's all water-wise plants. And so I just followed the instructions. So this is that design uh, going into place, the before and after. Um, as you all know, this is going to be a lot of work, so it's really good to implement your plan in phases. And it's probably going to be a multi-year phase, depending on the size of your, your yard. Um, so that might mean just taking one manageable section of your yard at a time, just biting off just what you can chew. Or it might mean just in the beginning planting the trees and the shrubs and prioritizing those because they take longer to establish. And then maybe over the following years, you can add in the flowers and the, the things that will take more quickly. Yes, please. Um, to one of Tiffany's points there, you do want to think of this as a multi-year process and don't bite off more than you can chew. I know this from experience. I, uh, my front yard was all Kentucky bluegrass, 120 feet by about 80 feet. And I decided to kill about half of that in one year. And that was more than I could chew <laughs> in one year. <laughs> and so it went to weeds, and I did little manageable sections every year after that. So start small. Yeah, this, this design was about 30 feet by 15 feet, and it was all I could handle in one summer. And then I've done more since then. Yeah, go ahead. Did you use mulch? Yes, I used pea pebble mulch. <laughs> yeah, we will, we will talk about mulch, but um, used appropriately, and there's no weed barrier underneath, so it's more just suppressing the weeds and um, holding the moisture in, actually, around the plants. How but thick? It's about two inches to be able to do any good holding the weeds back. 
Oh yeah, sorry, for those on Zoom, her question was, uh, why did I use uh, pebble mulch on that garden? Okay, well in that planning stage when you're looking, um, it is just very helpful to know your site well. So spend some time walking around your yard, maybe take pictures at different times of the year and different times of the day. Um, try to know which areas have full sun, which areas have shade, and maybe look around to see what's growing well naturally in that surrounding area. So, yeah. Is it hard to hear? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, for sure. Um, you want me to stand? So, um, like it says here, some questions that are nice to ask yourself is, um, what is important to me in my landscape? Um, what plants do I personally really love that I want to incorporate? What's the aesthetic that I'm going for? And um, very importantly is, how is this um, area going to be used? What's the purpose of my landscape? Which is a good time now to talk about grass and having turf grass. Yeah. So um, there is a place for grass in a water-wise landscape. Um, lawns are very appealing and inviting. If you have children and pets, uh, you're going to want lawn. So a couple of things to keep in mind is that you can just then limit the turf grass to a manageable size and maybe just a specific area. And avoid planting grass on steep slopes or areas that are hard to water. Um, in those areas, you might consider um, a drought-tolerant ground cover that will just kind of take off on its own and take care of those areas. Um, oh yeah, and learn how much water you're actually applying to your lawn each week. Do a little experiment and then also educate yourself on how much that lawn actually needs each week. Um, so maybe this, yeah. So for those of you out in Zoom land, the question was, how do you know if you've watered enough um, or too much? Um, too much, believe it or not, things will start dying just as if you hadn't watered them enough. Uh, the best way to tell that you've watered enough, most of us have a screwdriver. Take your screwdriver and try to stick it into the ground, someplace where you didn't hit a rock about an inch down. Um, that you actually hit dirt. You want to try to be able to get four to six inches into the ground. Then you've watered enough. If you can't, you haven't watered enough. Does that answer? Mm -hmm. Is there a way to know if there's too much water? Generally, just watching the plants. And if they're suffering as if they're not getting enough water, and you can get that in the the screwdriver in the ground you've probably watered too much because they do this they react the exact same way they wilt yes Nancy uh, do you recommend a certain kind of uh, grass for lawn here and also is there any disadvantage to substituting white clover instead of grass can you use white clover for a lawn I know the answer to part of your question, but not about white clover. So the question for those on Zoom was, uh, what kinds of grass would be recommended for our area, and can you substitute white clover? I don't know about white clover, do you? Okay, so she'll answer that part. I'll answer that in a minute. Yeah. Um, so on this next slide, Kentucky bluegrass uh, gets a bad rap, but according to Tony Kosky at CSU University, who has studied this deeply. Um, it's actually still the best grass species for many places here in Colorado when it is watered properly. Usually it's over watered. Um, so it can remain green and healthy with quite a bit less water than people generally uh, put on it. You could water it twice deeply, twice a week deeply, and it would do fine, maybe even just once a week, except for in July and August when it's very hot. Um, so 
that's an option. Fescues and rye also do well and maybe need a little less water and look, look really good. I'll pass it to Deb about the white clover. White clover. Yes, you can use white clover. If you have children, dogs, other animals that are going to be on it, the white clover cannot take that uh, traffic. So if your kids like to play soccer or football or whatever, the white clover is going to pretty quickly get torn up. So it's not that you can't use it. It's will it take the heavy traffic? Does that answer your question, Nancy? Sure. True. Um, what, what she just said, for those of you out in Zoom land, is the white clover can often be more tolerant to um, dog urine and cats and other animals, deers, whatever, um, than the bluegrass or the fescues can. That is true. Uh, it can, the, their urine happens to be alkaline. We think of it as acidic because it burns, but in fact, it's alkaline, and that's what's burning. And so you're just getting more alkaline. The white clover can handle that better. It is good to fill in with. It's just you probably don't want the whole lawn in it if you have heavy foot traffic on it. Um, the other thing you see with a solid bluegrass lawn is when we get into late July, August, maybe even early September these days, you, we, we are so hot that it goes dormant. So it turns brown. It isn't dead. It's just dormant. It'll come back as soon as it starts to cool off. What you've done is when you put just the bluegrass in is you've created a monoculture, one thing. If you'll go ahead and put in some clover with it or some fescues or some rye, those are more heat tolerant and so they will help kind of give you some color while the bluegrass is um, dormant and then they will start to die off when the bluegrass starts to come back in. Questions on Zoom? Nope. Questions in the room? Yes. Yes. Um, the question was, when the ground turns, when the lawn turns brown, what what happened with that? In the heat of the summer, it's going to go dormant. It's going to turn brown because it just can't take the heat. Adding more water does absolutely nothing but waste water. You cannot cool it down. The only way to cool it down is to provide shade. So a tree would help because that would give you some shade, but then the tree's going to need water. So it's always a trade-off. Yes? So it's okay just to go ahead. That's what I noticed in California. It's like you have a bright green hillside. They go brown in April out there. Um, and then it's, and then it's a golden color. Mm-hmm. Yes. So is that, is this an attitudinal thing that we think we need to have green grass all summer long? We just need to change our yes. attitude on that? that? That's a good way to put it. Um, what the, the question statement was is the grass going brown, is that just an attitude adjustment we need to make? And the answer is yes. We just need to realize that it is when it gets hot, it's going to turn brown, quit trying to drown it, live with it. But the other option is, is to put in something else with it that will help distract from it. So if you can put in a border of something pretty so that you're distracted from the brown and you're looking over at the pretty flowers 
or the nice pretty tree or whatever else it is you've chosen. Um, even lawn ornaments that are just whimsical. Anything that will distract you so that you don't mind so much that it's turning brown, it's going dormant. But yes, if you're going to have it, it's, you need to just accept that that's going to happen. Yes. Uh, well, not completely stop. It does need some water, but you should cut back, yes. Uh, the question there was, is should I just stop watering when it starts to go dormant? And it, it's going to need some just because it's still really hot here. Um, so even though it's dormant, it's still breathing and it's still taking up nutrients and water so and storing them for when it cools off. So you do need to go ahead and provide some water, but you definitely would want to cut back. If you were to go to the other extreme and say, I'm going to water this until it cools itself off and turns green, all you're going to do is kill it. You will drown it. Plants need air. And if you give it too much water, just like you give us, if you stuck us underwater, we would drown. You stick the plant underwater, its roots underwater all the time, it will drown. Any other questions? Those of you on Zoom, if you have a question, please type it into chat because we can't. We don't know the technology right this moment to to actually have you ask a question. So if you'll just tap it into the chat or Q and A, Tiffany will give it to us. Thanks. So. Any other questions in the room? No. The most important thing in any planting is your soil. Soil tests can tell you what type of soil you have, if you're lacking any nutrients, what you might need to do to improve it. There's different ways you can do soil tests. One is you can send it off to CSU or there is a, um, you can send it to the county extension. They will send it to a lab in Grand Junction. You can take it to the lab in Grand Junction on your own if you'd like. Uh, what you do is, is you take a sample of your soil, put it in a bucket, a bag, whatever, and send it off and then they send you back a little wonderful little report about your soil. Another thing you can do is take a quart jar, put about that much soil in it, a little bit of dishwashing liquid, you know, like, I don't know, Dawn, <laughs> palm olive, whatever you use, it doesn't matter, uh, just a few drops, fill the jar with water, shake it up, set it down. A couple days later you're going to go to our website and what you're going to find with your jar that's been sitting there is there are levels. One of them's all your sand, one of them's all your silt, one of them's all your loam, one of them's your um, organic matter, it's going to be floating on top and that will tell you what type of soil you have. The, what it won't tell you is if you're lacking any nutrients. We are fortunate for the most part in this area, unless you have had very recent new construction, that our soils have plenty of nutrients. The problem is, can the plants take it up? And the general answer to that is, if they're not taking it up, add organic matter. So when you do your little jar test, if you don't have a lot of organic matter floating up on top, then you're going to want to add organic matter. And that will, in fact, make the nutrients that are in the soil available for you. Thank you. So you can amend your soil. A lot of the, by adding organic matter or other nutrients as needed. Um, I will say, and I'll say it on this slide, it may be on another one. One of the least expensive um, things that we have that we can buy is cow manure. Cow manure is very high in salts. 
that's just cows. Our soils are high in salts. So you go and you buy cow manure and you think you're doing a wonderful thing because it's manure and it's organic matter and the cows were all fed on organic stuff and you spread it all out and all you do is burn all your plants because you just added more salt. So if you can get anybody else's manure, that would be wonderful rather than cows. Um, so worm compost, um, llamas, alpacas, horse, a lot of different places will provide you for free or very inexpensive manure because they need to get rid of it. Yes? So are you just spreading it on top? How do we want to add it in? To, to actually incorporate the organic matter into the soil, you're going to want to till it lightly. So you could do it by hand, or you could do it with a rototiller, but only a couple of inches. If you, yes, thank you. And I'm sorry, the question was, how do you get this incorporated into your soil? Um, if you're actually trying to get rid of your lawn, your grass, and put in something new, your grass becomes your organic matter once it's dead. So if you leave it in place and kill it, then you have organic matter. And you can just, when you start digging, you can till it in a little bit. The reason you don't want to do a heavy rototill, really deep, six inches, like we used to do, or actually go and, and turn it. Uh, you know, we used to go put in, go down six inches with your shovel and bring that up and turn it. We have now found that, we, they call them soil horizons. Every inch of soil has different organisms living in it. And they want to live at the level they're at. And so if you take the top inch and you put it three inches under, you just killed all those organisms that were living in that one inch. And the three inches down that you brought up, you just killed them because they like to be three inches underground. So that's why you want to do it lightly, no more than one or two inches, so that everybody, all the organisms that are in there that like to be there and, and help benefit your soil and the health of your plants will still be at the right horizon. Other questions? Does that say no to rototilling? Not exactly. Just make sure that you rototill lightly. So set your rototill at maybe two inches rather than it's four to six inches. So it's a light rototill. Uh, I'm sorry, the question was can you still rototill? The answer is yes, but not deeply. The question was, yeah, Indust okay, that's a good word for it. And the question was about industrial compost. Um, you can get some from South Canyon Landfill. You can also get from some from, um, thank you, Evergreen Zero Waste. Um, the problem with both of those is they contain human waste or can contain human waste. You do not want to put that in a vegetable garden. It has been composted. It is perfectly fine. Otherwise, it's fine to use it, but you don't want to use it in a vegetable garden, anything you're going to eat. If, if they tell you there is, that it's fine for a vegetable garden, then it is because they are reputable. But the stuff out of South Canyon has human waste in it. I'm not sure on evergreen. Yes. I, I have um, the data from the Pitkin County. Uh huh. Definitely no human waste. Is there other animal waste in it? No. Okay. No. So the, the statement. The, the people um, from uh, zero waste that pick it up, and I have some brochures from them. That Great. Thank you.
dog, cats, whatever. Okay. Okay. So uh, a person in the room happens to. Okay, so for those of you on Zoom, I'm going to give that in a real short, that the Pitkin County Landfill has assured that and tests theirs to make sure that it does not have any waste that is harmful to us, animal or human, which are animals also. So just be careful where you get it. Ask the questions. Most everybody is going to be reputable and tell you whether or not they test it, whether or not they exclude. Yes. Here, here in Carbondale, yeah. Just that you contract with them and you put your compost in the pail and they pick it up once a week. And then at, the, yeah, at certain times of year, they'll give you a free compost if you're one of their customers. Yeah, I picked up a lot of their compost just last Saturday, was it? Mm -hmm. They had it here. And it has a, a bit of horse manure mixed in with that compost. Okay, and that they've composted, I'm sure, long enough for it to be vegetable safe. If you're making your own compost, by the way, if you are putting any manure in or if wildlife can get into it, therefore there could be something in it, you need to let that sit for 120 days before you put it on vegetable crops. Anything else is fine. doesn't matter. Any other questions? The last picture. What was that about? Ah. Many of the native plants want to be um, mounded. So you can build your own mounds when you're amending the soil. Why? She looks at me like, why? The roots are deep enough. Well, let's, let's back up. Around here, we tend to hit bedrock in about six inches. That's an exaggeration, but at my house, sometimes I feel that way. Um, and it's not much further than that before the many places you are going to hit rocks. Some of the plants, their root system and their drainage is such, native plants, that they need to have further than that to go. And if they do, you can just do mounding. So you can just make your own mounds. If you do that, don't make it all out of compost. You do need some other dirt in there with it. So mix it with your compost with dirt and then do the mounding. And then plant on top, of it? And, then plant on top or, and or on the sides of it. For mm -hmm. example, in that plan I had, um, one of the recommendations was a lot of native shrubs, manzanita, fern bush, um, and they recommend just mounding your soil and adding quite a bit of sand and gravel to that mound to mimic, you'll see them growing on the side of Sopris. They're always on a hillside because they like really well draining soil. And so the mound creates that. It just gives them, gets their roots out of the water a little bit. Questions on Zoom? No? Questions in the room? Then we'll go forward. Plant the right plant at the right spot. So if you have a plant that needs shade, don't plant it in full sun. And that gets back to what Hesper was saying about look around your yard and see where do you have full sun all the time? Where do you have shade all the time? What is it that you actually have in your yard? And pick plants that fit that or provide for the plants to have that. So you might need to plant a tree to give you some shade because the plants you want are all need to be in shade or they need full sun and that plant 
and that tree's there, and they're never going to be in full sun. So maybe the tree goes. I hate to take out a tree, though. Never take a tree, the room says. Blue spruces, blue, blah. Blue spruces take a lot of water. Where they grow naturally, they get a lot of water. So sometimes that ends up being you want to do that. But, <laughs> yes, and there's this beautiful blue spruce, and you're, you're welcome to leave it. There is, but it's going to take water. Or it'll die in, you know, I call them dead trees standing. They're going to die in about 15 years. And trees die. When you see a tree die this year, it didn't die this year. It started dying five years ago or even longer ago. So you have to think backwards to what's happened in the last five years because that's what killed that tree the last five years, not this year. Yes, sir, you had a question. Yes, it is. He asked if that tree outside our window is a blue spruce, and yes, there's lines of them out there. Yep. And, and how does that tree receive its water besides from the heavens and from... When they water the lawn. When they... Yeah. When they water that lawn, yeah. No, they're just watering the lawn. I doubt it. Most likely, yeah. That I would assume everything out there is on city irrigation. Yeah. So. It does have a tap root. It does have a, a, a tap root, but how how long down does it go? I don't know. All trees, regardless of the tree, all trees, put roots out three times the height of the tree. So if your tree is 10 foot tall, it's got roots out 30 feet from it. They're taking up nutrients and water. The, root, the, tree, the, blah, the roots that are right underneath the tree, those are structural. And when you plant a tree, you want to make sure that you water really deeply right around the tree, not the tree itself, but around the tree, so that it puts down structural roots very deep. So when the winds come, it stays in place. Also, it will get some water that way, um, but it's not gonna get a whole lot of water that way. It's gonna get more of the water from the roots that are outside the drip line. We talk about the drip line on a tree. Doesn't rain inside there, it rains outside the drip line. Water at the drip line and out is what is better, unless you're establishing the tree, in which case you want to water within the drip line. So you have choices, and your basic choices are you can start things from plants or you can start things from seeds. Advantages and disadvantages to both. The main advantage of starting with a plant is you have one right away. Seeds take longer to grow. Plants have been grown in an ideal situation in a nursery somewhere. Probably not here, but maybe here. And they will be harder to get established because when you take them out of their beautiful container and the way they've been being grown and put them in the ground, they're going to suffer, they're going to be stressed until you get them used to being um, planted in our soils. Mulch. We talked about mulch a little bit ago. You can use all kinds of mulch. A few things with mulch. Rocks can heat it up. We mentioned that before. Um, wood chips can create a fire hazard. Both will allow weeds to grow if you don't have three inches or more, two and a half to three inches or more thick. 
If you have it that thick, plants that you would like to come back from seed won't. <laughs> so, pros and cons. But you want some mulch. You want at least an inch to an inch and a half of mulch to hold moisture in. Go ahead. What about landscape cloth under it? Is that good or not good? Yes. The question was, is landscape cloth good or not good? And the answer is, yes, it's good and not good, both. <laughs> um, the things that you don't want to come up through landscape cloth are going to, i.e., bindweed. Because it comes up through asphalt. It comes up through concrete. It comes up through anything. Um, but it will help keep some out. What you're planting, you're going to have to make a hole in the landscape fi fabric so that you can put your plant in the ground. So now you have a hole in it, and all the weeds are going to come up in that hole right where you just planted your plant or your seeds or your whatever. So you have that problem. So it's really not the best answer in the world, but it isn't necessarily bad. It also can keep air circulation down, which you do not want. You want to have air circulation. The microorganisms the, and the worms and everything else that live in the soil need air. And the landscape fabric will let through water and air, but it will decrease the air that goes in. And so you can actually end up drowning things more easily. It can end up being money that just got wasted. Because your most prevalent weeds are going to come up through it in our part of the country. Other parts of the country, that's not the case. About bindweed, yes. Be the deer. Okay. The question was, what do you do about bindweed? And the answer was, be a deer. <laughs> deer very effectively kill bindweed. Because Kansas State Fair does this every year. They plant a bindweed plant in March, I think it is. And then in August, when they have their fair, they show the roots. And they do it in like an ant farm, so you can actually see all the roots. And this display is like 10 feet tall by 20 feet wide. And it's just covered in roots everywhere. There's nothing but bindweed roots in there. That's how wonderful bindweed can grow roots. So when you go to get your bindweed out, and you reach down and you yank it up out of the ground because you are mad and you want to take it out on the bindweed. You yank it up out of the ground. You need one quarter of an inch, quarter of an inch of root to grow a new plant. And when you yank that out of the ground, you just broke the roots into many pieces. So what you did was you propagated bindweed. When deer eat bindweed, they go and they chop it off at ground level. So they didn't break the root. It didn't get to, make, to photosynthesize, so it couldn't get strong. So what you do is, is you go out every other day for three years. <laughs> I want to manage that expectation. It takes about three years. And you, and you break it off at ground level with your, with your fingernail or scissors or whatever. And the problem with that, you will cut down tremendously on your bindweed population. And you'll get, you will see effects within a couple months. One season you will see effects from that. But it'll take a few years if you have a good crop. However... We like birds, and birds eat the seeds. 
in your neighbor's yard, and then they poop in your yard, and there's bind seed, bindweed seed in there, and it will grow more. So the other option is learn to love it. It's a morning glory. It is in the morning glory family. Yes, it is better to just snip it off at the surface than to try to dig it out. Lots easier. Yeah. So you have lots of choices in mulches. What you really, what's really important with the mulch that you choose is that it holds moisture down. One other thing, the wood mulches, and many others too, when you water, they take the water first. So you would like irrigation underneath there, drip irrigation. So that you don't have to water an inch of mulch and get it wet before you ever got water down to the ground. That gives you an advantage of your pea gravel or other rocks that are broken up small. Watering. All plants need water, every single one of them, and they need it mainly to get established. So you're going to put in a brand new plant, and it's drought tolerant, and it just grows out there in the forest all by itself without anybody adding water to it, and it's growing on the mountainside where there's never any water. Why won't it grow in my yard? Because you didn't get it established first. So at first it's going to need water. Once it's established, then you can start cutting back on water. Even if it is an annual, for some reason, I'm sorry, I don't know the technicalities behind this, but the next year when it comes from its own seed, it will still need less water than when you first put it in. I don't know why, but that's true. Um, also, look at grouping your plants that need like water needs. So if this plant needs to be watered once a month, but this plant needs to be watered once a week, make sure that you didn't put those right next to each other because you're gonna drown one or kill the other. So try to go with plants that have common watering needs and put them together. That gets back to Hesper's point of a plan where you're, and the plans you can download. By the way, when you download those plans, nobody came to your yard to see if you implemented that exactly like they did it. You can look at all the plans and take bits and pieces of each one, but make your own plan so that you have an idea of where do I put plants that need light? Where do I put the plants I like that need shade? Where do I put high water ones? Where do I put low water ones? Fertilizing. Most of them won't require much fertilizer. Pretty much our soils will handle the nutrient needs of most plants that you're going to pick, especially if they're native plants. And we have some beautiful native plants. So there's no need to uh, amend. amend your soil except for organic matter. If you can't get the screwdriver in to see if you have watered it enough or not, you probably need to amend with organic matter. Thank you. Why plant natives? Because they already grow here. So you can go online to our website and Alex printed off some sheets for those of you in the room. Um, those of you that are out in Zoom land, we'll have a slide here in a bit. You can't write that fast, but when it gets on YouTube, you'll be able to get the links from there. Um, you can always go to ext.colostate.edu, and you can find our stuff there. Lots of plant lists. And you can take a screenshot if you know how to do such a thing. <laughs> Questions? Zoom or in the room? Yes. Yes. So I have grass, and I want to say goodbye. I want to kill it all. 
Um, and so I have been, I started out with plastic and I found that, oh, the ants really loved that and that was not the way to go. So I've been using cardboard um, uh, and that usually works, but is there anything else other than cardboard, especially if I want to leave the dead grass under it, I don't want to be digging up turf and throwing that away. So the question was, how do I kill my grass? Dr. Tony Kosky at CSU says, the best way to kill your grass, and you're going to hate me in Carbondale for this, but glyphosate, Roundup. Yes, and you can't use that here, right? Okay. But that is the best way to kill grass. So, yeah, no, it is. <laughs> now, having said that, because I'm required to say that, <laughs> it is. It will kill it faster than anything else. That's what why. Plant it will not harm it. If it's, pure if, if it's pure glyphosate and nothing else, it won't. It, you'll be able to plant within a week. In fact, you should be able to plant within a day. Um, if you don't want to use Roundup, and there's lots of reasons people don't want to, and they are all legitimate reasons, newspaper and or cardboard are your next best options. The option of, of other than that is you get the fancy machine or you go out yourself and you dig down and you hope you got all the roots and you literally dig the grass out. You would prefer to leave it so that you've got organic matter and didn't have to add more, yes. Are you going to leave the cardboard? Well, that's question. If, you, if you take the cardboard away, once you're done, you don't have to add any. Anything else. You can just start planting in the dirt. You would get better results if you would loosen the soil or till it just a little bit, an inch to two inches. Or take a garden fork, stick it in the ground, shake it back and forth, stick it in the ground, shake it back and forth. It's a lot of work. But you can do that. Um, if you want to plant on top of it, you are better off using newspaper because the roots can get through it. If you want to use cardboard and leave it, it's going to be most cardboard that's available these days. And in our environment, are going to take f five years or longer to decompose. And I don't think you want to wait that long to plant. How long does it take for the grass to die? A couple months, maybe four, maybe a whole season. Along with your plan, what you might want to consider, what I'm doing in my yard, after having bitten off more than I could chew one year and lived with that for the next 10 years, I now am killing smaller sections at a time. But to answer the actual direct question you asked, you're going to have to add at least six inches because almost everything is going to need at least six inches for its roots. And maybe do some mounding for those plants that need it even deeper sooner. Because it's going to take a long time for that cardboard to really break down. Newspapers will break down in a year or two. And roots can get through the newspaper when it's wet. So you could put an inch on top of it and then plant. In fact, if you put your mulch on top of it, you could probably then plant. Yes? So when I did newspaper in an area that was getting surface irrigation, the newspaper got wet. The bindweed was just having a field day growing through the newspaper. My other plants weren't spreading and getting enough water, and I was getting ants. So it was like newspaper was the worst. So in an area that I, so then I took all that off, put a thin layer of mulch down, the, the side yard where the big rock is, um, and I changed my irrigation so I'm drip irrigating all those plants, and it's great. And that was an excellent thing that you did. So what she said she did really was that she added drip irrigation to the plants she really wanted to have 
so that she wasn't watering everything. She was only watering what she wanted to water. Skip the newspaper and just let things die otherwise. Yes. putting down um, the cardboard and then putting uh, wood chips on top of it to, for my paths, for my pathways. Um, and it took about four years and the wood chips uh, deteriorated and the cardboard has deteriorated and I'm now planting in just digging out a spot and planting shrubs and that kind of thing in those areas. Um, my son and daughter-in-law are are doing um, the um, the heavy cardboard and then about four inches of wood chips on top of it and then they're making holes it through the cardboard and putting drips just in those holes and that's working out beautifully great and everybody heard that it took four years mm -hmm. so if you have four years that's an excellent way to go Okay, um, we're just going through some suggestions up here slowly while we're answering questions. Yes. So Nancy says it's nice to have plants that bloom at different times so there's always color in your garden, which is a good point when you're thinking about your plan and what you want in your landscape. Think about when these are in bloom. What do you want? Because you can have beautiful yard all year long, all, at least all summer long if you plan it out correctly. Good point. Thank you, Nancy. And then Nancy says she believes Roundup kills beneficial organisms, and then she linked to a website about it. <laughs> <laughs> and Roundup can kill. We, we all know that it does. It kills things. So that's the whole point. It kills things. Like I said, it, there, there, there's good and bad about it. I just am required to tell you what Dr. Kosky says. So I said it. in their area and they so we're, that's what we're thinking of doing but I'm I'm wondering if we want to leave the cardboard on afterward you know it, but so like I'm curious how long will it take for the grass to die if we did it this fall would grass be dead by next spring or would we need to leave it beyond like into the summer next summer you would need to leave it into the summer because the grass is going to go dormant over the winter and it probably won't care that the uh, cardboard's there. The other thing about c using cardboard that is a negative, sorry, I hate being negative, but um, water does not go through it easily. It's partly how it's killing. Roots from those trees are three times the height of the tree away from the tree. So you just put down cardboard in your yard. Where's the tree getting water? Unless you have a water source underneath the cardboard, you're killing your tree. If you did your whole yard. Sorry, there's not just easy answers to everything. <laughs> yes. So with your plant lists, is there any information on whether they're preferred to, to, to deer to graze? To yes. The question was, is on, when you look at our plant lists, um, are there any that are animal deterrent, so to speak? Um, the, the, the plant lists, we do have lists that are deer resistant. Resistant does not mean they're not going to come eat it. It just means they'll eat something else first and they'll eat that last. So they'll still eat it. If they are already accustomed to coming to your yard, and finding food, they're going to go ahead and try the resistant ones. Um, and it won't scare them. And I will give you an example. I put all of the roses in one bed because I thought, oh, I'll put all my roses together and have a rose garden. They were already in the yard, so I just transplanted them. 
And I said, I'll put lavender around them because it's deer resistant. Deer don't like to eat it. It doesn't taste very good to them. Deer don't mind stepping over it at all to get to the roses. They are not afraid of lavender or any other plant for that matter. So resistant is, they're not going to go after it first, but they still might eat it. They even take a bite or two off of the lavender from time to time. So usually that, they take a bite or two and they're done because they didn't like the taste, but. <laughs> Cactus is what's up on that. She said that they won't eat this one. Um, they don't. They don't care for cactus. But you know, they might take a bite. Depends on you know how prickly those thorns are and how hungry they are. Uh, as far as rodents go, I'm not sure there's anything that's really rodent resistant. If they want it, they're going to eat it. But they're going to eat trees first <laughs> before they and and fresh green things not more well-established. So we really kind of suggest that you look at natives because you're probably going to be very successful with those. And natives are, look around and see what's growing right around us. Don't go up in elevation and look because those things want to grow at a higher elevation. Look at things at our elevation. But don't exclude things that aren't native. If you find a plant, there's lots of drought tolerant plants that live well here that are, are not native. So you can, it's not to say don't use any, but you will have good success with native plants. And then we've given some non-native ones that we know do well. The plant designs have them as well as the plant lists will give you non-natives as well as natives. Yes? Sarah asks, when planning a new landscape design, what do you suggest to do with blue spruce tree roots that are growing on the surface of a lawn? What to do with the roots that are, and it's not just blue spruce, it's any, that are growing on the lawn um, at or at ground level. They're used to being there, so you can cover them up, but don't cover them up more than about an inch. They're used to being where they are, so it's kind of not a good answer, but that's really the only answer there is. You, yeah, you can, if you kill the roots, you're destroying the tree. So if the roots are wanting to be there, there's other reasons. What I would do actually is I would call the extension um, and ask them to have someone come out and take a look and see why you have so many roots at ground level rather than below ground level and address what that problem is rather than just a blanket answer. We've run over. They probably would like us to stop so they can go home. Um, but I do have a question. Who can name a noxious weed? <laughs> Who wants the book? Here, you named one. You don't have the book. For those of you on Zoom, sorry, I'm handing out a noxious weeds of Colorado book. Anybody else want one? I have a couple more. Anybody else want one? There is a native thistle. I don't kill all the thistle in the the, What you just heard was there is a native thistle. Yes, there is. There's more than one. Please don't kill a thistle just because it's a thistle. But kill the ones that um, aren't native. <laughs> the ones that are noxious weeds. Yes. that it would be better to walk water twice a week for 30 minutes than six times a week for 10 minutes. That is correct. It is better it is better to water less frequently and longer thereby deeper 
is what that really gets to than to water more frequently. When you water frequently, all of your roots stay just barely below ground level. And so they dry out and they die. And the spruce tree roots are yeah. And if you water deeply, grass, everything, all of your plants are going to put roots down deeper to get to that water because the deeper it is, the, more, the longer it stays moist and the longer that water is available. And that's what you want the roots to do is to go down deep. I'll go one more. And um, all kinds of negative stuff about cottonwoods, I hear. But I, they, I'm not going to get rid of them. <laughs> what can I do to keep them to be uh, not to drop their big heavy leaves, their, their big heavy uh, branches? And uh, what can I do to keep them as um, unharmful to my property as possible? <laughs> Would you write that question down? The question, in, just in case you didn't hear it, was what do I do with my cottonwoods that I want to, and any other tree or plant for that matter, spruce or whatever, that I want to keep? And quite frankly, with cottonwoods, I do not know. So we will find out and we will get back with you on that. You bet. And if you'll get Tiffany, your name, and Alex, can we send out the answer to that to everybody? Okay. So we'll answer that question, and Alex will send that out to everybody via email. So those of you on Zoom will automatically get it. Those of you in the room, make sure Alex has your email before you go. And thank you so much, and sorry we ran over, but we appreciate it, and I hope it was helpful. <laughs>